Okay, very welcome everyone to today's lecture. So the title of the lecture is The Field Equations in the Chat Formulation. And as yesterday, please feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have questions or comment or something similar. Okay, so what have we done yesterday? So yesterday you have seen the fundamental definitions of the theory, um, you have seen the inherent structures of the theory, and you have somehow understood the correspondence of these structures to Minkowski space. However, what we have not yet done, and this is what we'll do in this lecture today, um, is to talk about the dynamics It's to talk about the dynamics of the theory. And in fact, um, we will specify those dynamics really in terms of fields on space-time. And if you want to um, read a PDF while you listen to the lecture, you want to read up later, all of, what, all of that which I'm going to say in this lecture or in the next lecture, is contained in this paper. So the archive number is 1612.07192. So you can just download it and look at it while I explain it. Okay, let's just um, do a little setup of um, the mathematics. And um, at the same time, this is in a way a recap of what we've done yesterday. So what are we talking about? So we'll, we'll work in a little bit more general setting than yesterday, um, but you will see the connection right away. So we will assume that F is um, a non-compact non smooth manifold. We will assume that rho is a positive Borel measure on this a manifold. And we assume as yesterday that we are given a Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian as yesterday it takes two points of this manifold F and it gives me a positive real number. And in contrast to yesterday, so this is called Lagrangian, just as a repetition. And this was called the universal measure. So and in contrast to yesterday, I will not write down the explicit form of the Lagrangian, but I will make assumptions which this Lagrangian has to satisfy. Okay, so um, the assumptions are as follows. So I need those um, things in order to have the things which we'll talk about later in order for them to be well defined. So the first assumption is basically that this Lagrangian is symmetric. So in fact, this was a question yesterday. So this just means that L of x and y is the same thing as L of y and x. And this is true for all x and y in F. Um, the second assumption is that this Lagrangian is lower semi-continuous. L is lower semi So in case you don't know what this is, this is no problem. So let me just give you a little bit of an intuition about it. So this just, so you know what a continuous function is, and a lower semi-continuous function is just a function which can jump up. So basically, for example, let me just write it. So this is like a, so if this would be, let's say L of, so I have some X and Y is unspecified and this is Y. So what could happen is that I have, for example, something like this, so the function could be, I mean, this is like just to illustrate, it's not really how it looks. So the function could jump up. It cannot jump down. And if you think about yesterday, so the Lagrangian yesterday was, um, remember it was given in terms of those absolute values of the eying values of the closed chain. And so in fact, this Lagrangian is Lipschitz continuous, 
And lower semi-continue is even a bit more general than Lipschitz continuity. And the reason we work with that here is because there are several examples which you can write down and which you can really sort of solve or at least solve parts of it in which the Lagrangian is only lower semi-continuous. Just remember it jumps up. In, in general, by the way, like the, the assumptions, I'm writing them down so that things are well defined, but they're not essential. Yeah? You can also like just ignore them if you, if you prefer. Okay, so the third assumption is that the measure rho is locally finite. So this just means that um, <coughs> for every point in the manifold F, there is an open neighborhood which has, who, like whose volume, if you like, is not infinite. So maybe I should write it down. So this means just that for all X in F, um, there exists an open neighborhood U such that rho of u is not infinite, okay? This is important because as Felix told you yesterday, in general, this measure could also be like oh, the measure rho of f could be infinite. And the last assumption which we need, and this is a bit more important if you like, is that basically, so if I take this L and I just put in some x, but I leave the second slot open, yeah? So this function is rho integrable. Um, and so this is true for all, like, yeah, for all x in f. And furthermore, it gives a lower semi-continuous and bounded function. So I'm just going to abbreviate lower semi-continuity in general by LSC, yeah? And so giving a lower semi continuous and bounded function. And we'll need that in a minute. Okay, and this is already the setup. And now, of course, um, so if you think about yesterday, um, you saw this causal action. So is everybody, maybe I'll give you a little bit of time to catch up. So if you think about it, if there's any question, just let me know. So is this the assumption? So yeah, this is the assumption. So if I integrate this with rho, the corresponding function, it's just a function of x. I'll write it down in a minute, this function. And this by function, we assume it is bounded. Obviously. That's an assumption, yeah. All of those are assumptions. Uh, so yeah, so the, the assumption says this is rho integrable, and the resulting function, if I've integrated, is lower semi-continuous and bounded. It's part of the assumption. Ah, yeah. Ah, Sorry, it's maybe just like a bad way of abbreviating. Okay. So, um, yeah, so now we can go to the next part. This was basically the setup. So, um, yeah. So part two is basically the Euler-Lagrange equations. So this is um, the second part, and maybe let me just add for completeness. So this setup and recap was the first part. Okay, so all of you remember yesterday we had this causal action. And the whole um, idea of like the theory is to look for minimizers of this causal action. And in fact, this is what we'll make precise. So what are we looking for? And let's just put this in terms of a definition. So um, the measure rho is a minimizer. So the term minimizer is basically what I'm defining now. Um, oops. <coughs> of the causal action. Um, if the following is true, if S of rho, so this means I plug, I take the causal action, plug in the measure rho tilde, minus S of rho um, is, and this whole term is supposed to be bigger equals zero, 
And now for what is the question? So we know rho is the thing we want to define. Um, if this holds um, for all measures rho tilde, which satisfy the following two things. So first of all, the total variation, I'll explain in a minute what this is, if you like, let me write it like this, is smaller than infinite, smaller than infinity, um, and the difference has volume zero. Okay. So let me just explain what this is. So this is the end of the definition, if you like. Now, what are those things? So this, here, I'm not writing TV here. Some people write TV here. So this is the total variation. Uh, and this here, basically, is the volume. So it's not so important what exactly so, or maybe let me put it like this. So first of all, why do we need those assumptions? Well, those assumptions basically um, make sure that the left-hand side here is well-defined. So I will not go through this in detail, but you will see in the, lemma, in the paper, there's a lemma that only if those two things hold, is this well-defined also, for example, in the case of infinite volume. That's why we need this, yeah? So maybe just... Um, I'll just put this down as a remark. So may maybe let's do it like this. So this gets a little last, a little star. Um, yeah, so this is well defined because, so the to what's the total variation of a measure? So basically, the point is that this measure here, the, if I take a measure and I subtract another measure, it's in general a signed measure, so it's not positive anymore. And the total variation basically is just the volume of the positive part plus the volume of the negative part. So there's a decomposition in measures. It's called the um, Han, uh, Jordan Hahn or Hahn Jordan decomposition or Jordan decomposition. And um, this basically says whenever you have a signed measure, you can decompose it in a positive part and a negative part. And this is just the volume of the two parts. So basically, by assuming this, yeah. Um, or that, so basically, no, technically speaking, those are two independent assumptions. That's what I have to assume. I need a measure for which those two things hold. And only if, the, if they hold, then the left-hand side of um, the equation above is satisfied. So maybe I'll just write this down. So you can imagine it like that. So for example, so basically what this says, only the difference of the two is, has volume zero. So for example, think about um, a Lebesgue. So in fact, just postpone your question for a little bit because I'm going to write something down where you see it, how it would. Uh, yeah, you can say it like this. Yeah, exactly. So maybe I'm just writing it down like this. So for those people who are taking notes. So the condition star means that the left-hand side of the two condition two star is well defined. Okay. Another the fundamental question which we now have to ask is the following. <clears throat> so the question is, what does this imply for the definition imply for rho? Okay, so it's a definition. It says for all other rho tilde, um, a certain condition has to hold. So what does this imply for the measure rho? So for the minimizer itself, and in like as usual in physics. This is basically, this question is answered by the Euler-Lagrange equations. And I'm just going to abbreviate them as EL. EL is always Euler-Lagrange equations. 
And I will just tell you um, the Euler-Lagrange equations in terms of a lemma. Now it's, a, it's not so easy to write on those two blackboards such that you can see everything, so just let me know if you don't see something that you would like to see. Okay, so this is lemma, and this is really central for um, the whole theory, this lemma, if you like. And let me just write it again. This lemma is called, oops, lemma is basically the Euler-Lagrange. So what does it say? Well, let rho be a minimizer. Just as we have defined it over there. Um, and then the following thing holds. Ah, I forgot one thing, sorry. Um, let's just put it into the lemma. Then there's a function, then for <coughs> L of x, so this is a little l, I hope you can see this, which is defined as follows. So basically what I do to define this function, I just take the Lagrangian of x and y, and now I just integrate over the whole manifold f with the measure rho over y, okay? And then I just subtract a constant then for this function, and this function is really central, so maybe I'll give you some little bit of time to basically to copy it. This is a popping up all the time from now on. And maybe just let's write it like this. So this here is a, this is a constant, which we choose later. Then for this function, we have an equation. And those, those are basically the Euler-Lagrange equation corresponding to the first variation of this action. And this equation looks as follows. So it's L, this function L, restricted to the support of rho. And I will explain this equation in a minute. Is equivalent or is equal to, identical to, the infimum over all of f of the function L itself, okay? And I put this in the red box because this is a central equation. And I'll refer to this equation as EL. So let me just draw a picture. Or maybe while you copy it, I will clean the other board, and then I'll draw a picture to explain what this equation means. So again, what it says is that there is this function L, and if I evaluate this function L at a point which is in the support of the measure rho, then the value I get is always the smallest value of L. I'll explain it in a, mic in a picture in a minute. Okay, what does this basically mean? So what it means is, um, so you can think about it like, so um, illustration. So what this means is the following. So let's assume we have L here. So this is not a function L. And let's just assume we have F here. Of course, in general, f is not a line, but it's just an illustration um, of what happens. And let's furthermore assume that we have um, a support of rho. Let's say we have two closed subsets of f. So yesterday we've learned in Andreas' lecture that the support is a closed subset. Um, 
So let's say this is the support of rho. So then what the, this lemma is basically saying, well, there's a smallest value of L, and whenever I'm in the support, I'm like the function is really equal to the smallest value. So first thing which this implies it, that, is that on the support, this function is constant, because at every point it takes the smallest value. And second, it implies that everywhere else it's larger. So we know it's a lower semi-continuous function, so for example, like it could jump up, so maybe here it's, it continues like this, and now this is supposed to be a function. Um, or here it could like do something like this, it could be smooth, or it could. So we don't know what happens, but we know basically that um, it's always larger or equal outside of the support of rho. So this, maybe I'll just draw it again in L, in red. So this would be an example for what those Euler Lagrange equations, so this would be L of um, x, if you like. And this is like, so maybe, yeah. No, that, so that's the equation is saying that's, that's what cannot happen. This is exactly what it excludes. Exactly. So I would say it like this also, by the way, those constant lines are supposed to be constant. So um, I would say it like this. So what this equation tells you um, is that wherever I go, in any, any point, let's say any point y and f, for example here, the equation says, well, this value you find has to be larger or equal to the value which you found on the support. Because on the support, it actually takes the smallest value possible. Yeah. So maybe, so I, yeah? Why is it zero? Oh, it, we'll choose zero in a minute. So in fact, we will choose this constant nu so that it is zero. Just, I'll do that after the lemma. Yeah, sorry? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So maybe let's let's put it like this. So I wanted to prove this anyway. It's a short proof, and then you can see the proof, and then we can talk about this question again because the proof shows you that it needs to be larger, and it's also like I think it's in like a sort of illustrative proof. So how would we prove this? Okay, so what we do is just, um, we do what we have just talked about. So we will pick an x0 in the support of rho. <clears throat> and then we choose um, an open neighborhood. U of x0, which has the following properties. So we want the measure to be bigger than zero. So this is possible because x0 is in support. The, the volume of u is supposed to be bigger than zero, but it's also not supposed to be infinite. This is possible because we assumed locally finite. This is possible because x0 is in the support of rho. And then um, we now, so then basically we fix a y in f. And all those choices are arbitrary, and that's what we will use later. And then we define basically a family okay so this family is we'll just give it a tilde here and a tau so tau is just now some parameter um, as follows so how is this family defined so let me write it down and then I'll explain it so we'll basically just say rho tilde tau is, we'll start with the original minimizer which we had, and now we'll subtract something as tau, so this min so maybe I would just say, let me just say minus delta delta here just to say that the zero is in the parameter range. So then we subtract something from this original measure we started with. Namely, we subtract, this is the characteristic function, 
So we subtract basically the original measure in this neighborhood U with which we have chosen. And then we add it somewhere else. So we add the whole total volume which we have subtracted at the point Y. So let me just say what those things are. Where's the blue chalk? So this is the characteristic function. And this is the Dirac measure at Y. So what this means is basically, just to give you a little illustration, so let's assume um, we're now, this is our F, and we have um, the support of rho, let's say is here. And then we have our X zero somewhere here, put it here. And then what we do, we just take, we have this neighborhood U, and as tau increases, Oh, and sorry, and we also have the point Y. As, as tau increases, we just cut off more and more of this measure rho and put it to Y here. Okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. You're right, yeah. Sorry. So the parameter range is in zero to some small delta. Okay? So put it in red here so that you have see if you're copying notes. Okay, so if you put tau equal to zero, we just have the original measure rho, but if tau increases, we just subtract parts of this new, of this original measure rho and put it somewhere else. And so what this implies is, I mean, this is just basically, so if I write down rho tilde tau minus rho, then this is given by exactly what I've written here. So this is minus tau psi u rho plus um, tau rho of u delta y, okay? And I'm just writing this because what you see here is that first of all, the volume, that's your question um, from before. So this is exactly what we have to consider in this definition of minimizer, right? The difference of some other measure to this one. And what you see here, first of all, if I apply this difference to the whole space, so I'll get a rho of u here as well, so you see the volume is conserved. And in fact, since this has finite measure, this u, the total variation is also conserved. So maybe let me just write it like this. So I think those things were, so this um, satisfies star. And star was this volume constraint, or this volume preservation and this total variation preservation. And now um, just recall from yesterday, that um, the causal action was written as follows. So let me just write it down. S of rho tilde tau um, was given by a double integration, L of x, y. Then I have a little space, d rho tau of x. Now let me put y in the middle, first one, and d rho tau of x. Okay, this was the causal action we had yesterday. And now, if you look at the definition of this function L, which we have up here, yeah, so this was the function L, so you see that the definition of the function L is exactly what's in the middle here, up to this constant, okay? So this part is exactly L of x plus nu half, okay? So what we can do now, we can now take a look at the left-hand side of, so for, as a two evaluate, maybe let me write it like this, two evaluate. So basically what this number is saying is that the action is the action of this variable that you measure? This lemma, no. So Um, at least I don't see it right now. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And we'll come to this, like, to this choice that L of X is zero. I'll come to that in a minute. 
Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, why not? As, uh, sorry. Good, good question. Good question. Yeah. So, okay. Um, this is correct. So, this is maybe let me write it down. If, uh, yeah. So, let me just put a tau here. It's correct because, like, the L is depending on the measure rho. And now, um, so this, this is just like, you, so, okay. So, let me just write the next step, then it becomes clear why I wanted to write this. So now I want to evaluate this double star. So this was just this condition. Let me write it again. This was this condition that S of rho, in our case tau tilde, minus S of rho um, is bigger equal to zero. And if I want, now I want to write down what this equation is. So this is bigger equal than zero. And now I want to write down what this is. And now you see, so if I, so I have to look at the definition of rho over here. So I have those three terms, okay? So first, I plug in this row for on both sides of this action here. And this term cancels with this S of row, which I've written here. And next, we're interested in the linear terms, and in fact, only in those. So what happens if we have the linear terms? So I'll put a tau here to denote the linear terms. Well, this always means one of them is chosen as row, and the other one is chosen either as the, f as the first term or as the second term. And now, if the first one, if this inner one is chosen as row, then it's really L, and that's why I wrote it down. So what will, well, actually, let me just write the result. So this is two tau, and then what you get is as follows. So this is rho of u times L of y um, plus nu half. So this is basically if I plug in the last term outside, minus, and now I'm subtracting um, the integral over u. This comes, it's not f because of the characteristic function. And then what do I integrate? Well, I integrate L of x plus nu half, the rho of x. Okay. And then I have terms which are order tau squared. And now we're almost done with the proof. So the second term comes about from just plugging this row in here, in the inner, inner part, and this second term here in the outer part, yeah? If, if you can't read it, let me know. Is that okay? John, you want to, is there any? Here? No, because I have this, um, the rock measure here that kills the integral. Yeah, so basically, so I have L of X here because I put in the row here and then here I have this Dirac measure at Y and this integrates, this kills this integration. Yeah. Okay, so what I get from all of this is, and if you have questions, you can also let, come up later and we can talk about it again in detail. So that, therefore, we have the following situation. So we know that this thing needs to be larger or equal than zero, and we know the linear term is this, so we know that um, this thing in brackets needs to be larger um, or equal to zero, and what this just implies is um, the following. So therefore, I just have, um, yeah, let me write it like this, L of y is bigger or equal than one over the integration of u, um, then I integrate over u this L of x Hero of x. Okay, so basically those other um, those news drop out. Now, if you think about this a little bit, um, there's two ways you can think about it. The first way is basically just think about this neighborhood u getting smaller and smaller. So what happens is then then I have a general y over here, and basically I have I mean if you think about this in this intuitive way, I have this l over here. So this, like if this neighborhood u gets smaller and smaller, I'm left with something like L of x zero. So maybe I'll write it like this, and you can also make, a, make sense about this more formally if you think about the definition of lower semi-continuity, but I'll just motivate it in this intuitive way. So this implies that L of y is larger or equal than L of x zero. And this is exactly true, so because y and x zero were arbitrary, 
Um, therefore, this is true for all y in F and x0 in the support of rho. Okay. And this is exactly, if you compare this again with, maybe I'll just put it up. If you compare this again with the original lemma which, which we had, this is exactly the statement of the lemma. So this just says, well, for any point on the manifold, you're always larger or equal than if you evaluate the L at a point in the support. It's just this equation. Okay, so this finishes the proof. Okay, in time. Okay, and finally, let me just say maybe we can put that up in here, up here still. So, and we always choose the constant mu, mu half, such that. L, function L, on the support of rho is, or I should, maybe I could have written, is zero. So this means the infimum is zero, yeah? And so this brings us to basically the equation we wanted to get at, the second part. So therefore, the Euler-Lagrange equation, the Euler-Lagrange equation of causal action is L restricted to the support of rho is equal to the infimum of L over F, and this is equal to zero. So those are the Euler-Lagrange equations of the causal action, and this is what we will now work with. Okay, questions so far? So I would put it like this. So um, only, like only if, so only if a measure is a minimizer, only then L is zero by our choice of the constant, and only then the action is given by the, con by the volume, like by the integration of this constant, or by this constant times the volume. But in basically looking for minimizers, we are also considering measures which are not minimizers, and if they're not minimizers, this does not hold. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah? Why is the volume bigger than L is zero? Because at least in, we have the one over the rho of u. So there's what two, yeah. Mm -hmm. the u be the biggest and measure would the L one be zero. So the point is this, like we have chosen this neighborhood here and we are free to choose it up to this. So there's two ways to uh, like understand how do you go from up there, how you basically make this step here. And one way to understand this is that we, go, we just make this neighborhood smaller and smaller. So think about it like this. So x0 is in the support of rho. Mm -hmm. Sorry? No, no, no. We take smaller and smaller and smaller neighborhood. Think about it like the up here again. So how the support of rho is defined in such a way yeah. that every point, for every, so x0 is in the support of rho if every neighborhood has a volume which is not zero, it's larger than zero. And so we just take, so basically maybe just to edit this, so what we do is we just take u smaller and smaller. 
in order to do this last step. And in fact, yeah. This is what we do to go from here to here. And you can also make this precise by just thinking about what it means to be a low semi-continuous function. If you have a look at the paper, we do it like this. It's just like one sentence. But since I didn't define it very precisely, I want, don't want to do this here. But we make this neighborhood, we, were, we chose this neighborhood here, and there was a freedom in choosing it. And now, in this step, we just choose it smaller and smaller. And, and if you do it smaller and smaller, basically, I mean, you can't see this right away, but if you, like, it really turns out that this um, approach is x0. So the question is, why do you Yeah. So, so the point is this, like, being in a, like, um, so, um, okay, yeah. So, ba yeah. And then, yeah. So that's true, and additionally, we're working with a Borel Sigma algebra. So you know that there's, like, a, a suitable, nice class of yeah. neighborhoods. Yeah. Okay, so maybe let's go to the next part. If there are no questions, or I mean, if there are questions, just interrupt me. So the next section is basically, um, this is part three of the lecture, and it's called Fields on Space Time. <clears throat> okay, so um, the nice thing, so maybe let's, so what's really nice um, above is that um, if you recall um, that the support of rho was exactly what we called space-time. Okay, so therefore the Euler-Lagrange equations so what this says is that the Euler-Lagrange equations somehow are, have something to do with space-time. So this is already nice. However, as I said in the beginning, we sort of seek to understand the theory more in terms of fields. So what we want is a connection in terms of like connection or description, maybe let me put it like this. Description and I'm just going to put generalized here because they will not be the fields which you know right away. In the, lect in this, in the lecture in the afternoon today, Felix will tell you more about the connection. Generalized fields, so that's what we're looking for. <clears throat> and how do we get this? By particular variations. And I will explain how this works now. Okay, so above we have seen that we have considered a particular variation and we have consider the first derivative, and then we have obtained the Euler-Lagrange equations of the theory. Um, and what we will do now is we'll do, we'll take into account, or we'll take a look at more general variations, which are infinitesimally, then give the right, the right notion of fields for this theory. So how does this work? So again, we say let rho tau tilde. So this time we'll really have tau in minus delta delta, um, a family of measures. And not just any family of measures, but the following. So we will choose rho tau tilde as follows. So we'll start with a minimizer. So this is again a minimizer as before. And then, first of all, what we'll do, we'll multiply this minimizer by a function f tau. It's just a function times a measure is still a measure. 
So maybe um, where will I, where's the best way to write down? So um, I'll write it here. I know I'm just not confusing, but otherwise it would be difficult for you to see. So what is f tau? So f um, is basically a smooth function from some parameter range, which I'm just going to call delta, minus delta, delta, times the whole manifold f. Um, let me just write it like this, 2 r plus, so it's not 0 and it's not negative, okay? And this tau is exactly basically this parameter which I'm having here. So this is the first step. And the second step which we're doing is basically, now this is a measure again, and now we'll just take a family of diffeomorphisms. So maybe let me write it like this. So big F will be, well, first of all, a function which again takes the same parameter range, minus delta delta, times f, but now gives it to f, like puts it back to f, so this will in fact be a family of diffeomorphisms. And um, before I forget it, let me just write right here that there's two things, so basically, um, we, we require that f0 um, is just 1, and f0 is just the identity, okay? And so now we take one of those diffeomorphisms, and I'm just going to denote it by f tau, and then what we'll do, we'll just take this measure, and what we can do if we have a diffeomorphism is we can basically push the measure forward, okay? Or pull it back, in fact. That's the push forward. So we can push it forward, yeah? So this is just the same thing as we've done yesterday. So let me just say this is the push forward. Along F tau. Okay. So that's what we can do. Just a general variation. Is everybody sort of familiar with the push forward or you want me to write down again what it means? Yeah? Uh, what is the capital of uh, what the form of uh, capital F2? Sorry, what the? Uh, the capital F2. Yeah? What, what is the form of uh, the capital F2? What, what do you mean with board? The uh, I mean, uh, yesterday we yeah. had uh, this side, uh, the um, Minkowski scale. And yeah. Uh, this side, uh, yeah. the CFF. Uh, ah. Scale. So this is a different F. It's not the, not the F from uh, yesterday. I, I have a, a general question. Yeah. I mean, uh, does it matter what is the right side of the F? Yeah, so here it's very important that the F is really a map, which takes, so maybe let me write it again, down in this way. So this F tau is a map which takes the manifold to itself. And it is a diffeomorphism. That's important, yeah. Okay, maybe I'll just clean the board, or, um, and then I'll tell you, maybe let's do it like this. I'll clean the board, and while I do so, I'll explain to you how this, um, why this is sort of related to a notion of fields, and then I'll write it down after I clean it, because this is important. Okay, so what's the, in so maybe let's do it a little bit interactive. So what, what if I take, so now the thing is, I take the derivative, like I want to know, intuitively speaking, how is it, what's the derivative of that thing, right? And then the point is, this derivative is basically given by two, um, two individual objects. First, it's just a derivative of a tau-depending function. So it's the derivative of f tau. Well, that's just a smooth function. So that's one part. Second thing is a derivative of this large f tau. Well, basically, if you like, a derivative of a family of diffeomorphisms is a vector field. So basically, infinitesimally, this is described by function in a vector field. And this is exactly, I mean, this is not clear a priori, but it turns out that this is really a good notion of fields on the manifold. And I'll write that down in a minute. And then in the next step, we will construct field equations. So the Euler-Lagrange equations, which we've just um, derived, they allow to construct field equations for this notion of fields. And in general, it's like, as I said, different to what we usually have in physics, but Felix will explain this connection today in the afternoon.
Okay. So let me just write down what I just said. <coughs> so infinitesimally, this family is described by the following things. So first, I have a smooth function. And um, this function is just, like, let me write it like that, f dot zero. So that's just as usual the derivative of f in zero. So this is a smooth function from f to r and um, a smooth vector field. And so this smooth vector field is basically, um, let me just write it like this, so as a little bit as in differential geometry, f dot at zero. And this is just an element of C infinity, if you like. I mean, it's a vector field um, on the manifold, so it's an, an, a map from f to tf. And this is a little bit too general, but just to give you a flavor. Okay. Um, and as I said, those are those. It turns out are constitute a good notion of fields. And in fact, um, so what we'll do is um, we will combine them to form a chat. So basically, so this is, so we'll combine them as follows. So first of all, let's just denote this here by A, and let's just denote this here, uh, maybe also in red, by U. So A is a function, U is a vector field. And then what we'll do is we'll introduce chats. So here I will always denote them by just taking a letter and putting a line under it. If you look at the paper, we use this math rack um, font. And so u is now defined as just a tuple. It's the function a and the vector field u. And this is called a chat. And it's called a chat because this is really the notion of one chat which appears in, like if you're familiar with chat bundles. Um, but here it's just a name. So we were just looking for a name which, which was not used so far. Like in physics. I should say, and this appeared like a good name. So this is a chat, and this is really the central object which we, we will work with. And to our corresponding chat space is just all of them. So the chat space is just so a J, math frag J, if you like. And this is just defined as follows. So I just take all chats which have this form, A, U, where um, A is a smooth function from um, F to R, and where U is a vector field, a smooth vector field. So let me again just write it like this. This is C infinity from F to TF. Okay. So this is the chat space. And we can also consider the restriction to M so M, that's space-time. And um, since we still want to work or so want to say that functions are smooth, so um, maybe I should say it like this. So um, smooth functions, vector fields. on M are just defined as those smooth functions, uh, as those, let me say, functions or vector fields, as those, let me write it like this, those which have a smooth extension to F. Okay. 
And um, I'm just gonna write this down here in blue. Why is this important? Um, because M need not be That's why I need to say this. What do I actually mean when I say smooth? And so, like wh with this definition here, saying uh, which tells us what smooth functions are, we can just define the jets restricted to M, the jet space to restricted to M. Well, this is then just the same thing we've written down before. This is U given by A and U, where now A is a smooth function from M to R and U is a smooth vector field. And this can be TF here, still correct. Oh, so be just because M is space time. Mm -hmm. And M is just the support of the measure row. And this is what, like, uh, maybe let me put it like this. Um, so, so we could, could uh, restrict ourselves to the support of row instead? No, but we could restrict ourselves to a neighborhood of the support of row. So this will come up later when I write down the f the, those field equations. You'll see they will become equations on space time. Okay, and so with this we can talk about the weak Euler Lagrange equations. So. part four, after we now have this notion of fields. And maybe let me start like this, that the power of the jet formalism um, is as follows. So we have now just, I've sort of motivated that jets can be used to describe those particular variations. And now, what I can also do is chats can be used to test weekly. And this is basically um, what, like why this whole thing works so nicely. And um, before doing this, before explaining this, I need a, um, a preparation. Namely, I need the notion of semi-derivatives. And this is something very simple. So a right semi-derivative So you all know what a derivative is, yeah? Yes. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So the right semi-derivative is just the same derivative, so it's just the same as a derivative, but I'm just taking the limit from the right, yeah? So um, limit as derivative, let me just write it down, derivative, but limit from right. So let me just give you an example of this. And in fact, this is what we'll need later. So let me just write it like this. So D, and now I'm putting a plus here to denote that it's the right derivative. And then I'm putting a V here, first of all, to tell the vector field. So V is a, a vector field. In this case, it's in the tangent space of X, at X of F. And then there's a one here to just denote that this derivative is acting on the first variable of L. So this thing here is just defined, well, as usual, you would have a limit. But now the important thing is that I'm just taking the limit from above. So maybe let me write it like this. Okay, so it goes to zero, but from above. And then I just have the usual difference quotient. So in this case, I would have one over tau, and then I would have L, and now gamma of tau, and Y, minus L of X. Y. Um, and here, gamma, maybe I should write it like this, um, with gamma curve 
such that gamma dot at zero is v and gamma at zero is x. Okay, so just as usual, a directional derivative, just new symbols plus to denote the right semi-derivative and one to denote that it's acting on the first variable of this L. And similarly, I would have the left semi-derivative So this would be exactly the same thing. I just would copy everything and I would write from left here. And in fact, I will just add it to this formula up here. So if I have the left semi-derivative, this would be a d minus one v l of x y. And this would be exactly the same thing as above. So this is just the limit and the rest, the remainder of those things are exactly the same, but now, of course, I'm taking the limit tau from to zero from below. Okay, and I need those two notions as a preparation for this and for the next lecture as well. And why do we work with this left and right derivatives? Well, if you, or maybe I'll give you a minute to catch up. So remember that the Lagrangian of the theory is Lipschitz continuous, yeah? So typical proto-example for Lipschitz continuity would be something like this, yeah? the absolute value function. And this function is not differentiable here. However, the semi-derivatives exist. And this is why we need those semi-derivatives and need to work with those. And in fact, like, um, yeah. So maybe let me clean the board while we'll see whether there's questions about that. So not if you have a regularization, like not necessarily if you have a regularization. Okay, but already there, you say yes. Yeah. Felix, you want to add something or? <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, it's good. Like many questions are good. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so, and since we, like, so as I said, in this case, the semi-derivatives would be basically pointing in this direction, and, I mean, I'll just say it, but yeah, one has to be a little bit, and in this direction, because there's an extra minus sign when I take this limit. But so basically, nevertheless, the, the essential point is they're well-defined, also in this Lipschitz continuity, continuity in this Lipschitz continuous setting. And in fact, like since we work in this lower semi-continuous setting, let me just say very briefly, um, we sort of need to assume the existence, but we can do it in the following way. So this is assumption number five, like left and right semi-derivatives of L exist in um, in R cap infinity, so they can also take infinity as a value, and assumption six. So this is just for completeness. Um, those can be exchanged. with row integration. So those are additional assumptions which we'll have to make in this general setting. Okay, and back to the Euler-Lagrange equations. 
So now I'll explain how, in which sense we can test them weekly. Okay, so I mean, um, I've cleaned them, like I've erased them by now, but you remember that the Euler-Lagrange equations basically said two things. So the Euler-Lagrange equations imply, well, first of all, they imply, maybe I'll write them again, down again, just to be sure. So the Euler-Lagrange equation said, L at the support of rho is equal to the infimum of L, and this is by choice zero, okay? So those Euler-Lagrange equations imply two things. But first of all, clearly, they imply that if I evaluate M, L at the support of rho, which is the same thing as M, well then this is zero. And furthermore, they imply that if I take a semi-derivative in the direction of some vector field of L, and if I evaluate this on the support of rho, well, it's either zero if I'm like in the interior of the support of rho, because the function L was constant on the support of rho, <coughs> or it's larger than zero if I'm at the border, like um, sorry, at the boundary of the support of rho. So this is larger or equal than zero. Okay, that's what they imply. And think again about this picture I have made, like so, yeah. I'll not draw it again to save some time. <coughs> okay, and in order to express this in terms of chat, we'll have, let's see, in chats, we'll have to define a new object. And I know there's lots of new definitions, but sort of it pays off in the end. Like for example, you, you will really find that this description in this, in, in terms of chat with this new, de new definitions is kind of nice. So we'll have to define a directional derivative in the direction of a chat u. And I'm just going to do the semi-derivative here, but it works the same for everything else. So we pick a chat u. As before, this is just given by a and u. Now we define this directional semi-derivative in the direction of a chat u of the function l, but it would work for any function at x as follows. Well, we just take a of x L of x plus, and now I just take du a dv plus L of x, a u, sorry, why did I think it's a u here? Okay, so I just take the scalar part and multiply it to the function L, but it would work the same for any other function I put here. And I take the vectorial part and just take the semi-derivative in that direction of this function L. There's no one here because this just has one argument. Okay. And then finally, or almost finally, then really I have the Euler-Lagrange equations imply the following um, equation, and that's almost a weak Euler-Lagrange equation, so that's nabla u plus, this is just what I've defined right here, of L at x is bigger and equal to zero for all x in M and for all u in J. In fact, I could put, yeah, could put an M here, okay? So I can put an M here. So what this just says is, just to recap, and then we'll do one more step, and then we're done with this part. Um, I mean, yeah, it's with the weak Euler-Lagrange equation. So I know the Euler-Lagrange equation imply those two things. Now I just patch this together in a nice way. Because, and then I have this sort of equation, and basically saying this holds for all U, yeah? Just means that this holds for all a and all little u here, and this just means, so if this has to, ho if this is, c um, ah, okay, yeah. Okay, maybe I'll leave it like this and explain what I just wanted to explain in the next step. There's one more step, and then I'll write down the weak Euler-Lagrange equations. Um, okay, finally, we will define di differentiable jets. Um, and the notion is J div here. Um, <coughs> and they're defined as follows. So they're just diff chats. They are chats U, which are defined on M, such for them, such that for them, the following holds. So we want the positive M directional derivative of L to be the same 
as differentiating in the other direction. So there's two minus signs here. Yeah, so like this, yeah. Okay. And this, this thing here would be really the same as the negative spin derivative of L. Okay, so those are the differentiable jets. And if you look at this equation a little bit, we can discuss it too later tonight, or if you look at it now, so you see this really just says that this function L is differentiable in the direction of this vector field. And then finally we have, then finally we have what I wanted to come in this, like, um, in this part, let's say. Um, so then finally we have the weak Euler-Lagrange equations. Okay, and how do they look? They look as follows. They basically say that this direct nabla u of L at M is equal to zero for all um, <coughs> for all u. And now I could write, so I'm just gonna write J test here, and J test is just a subset subspace of J diff. And this is just for, I mean, I'll explain later why we choose this top space. Okay, and those are the weak Euler-Lagrange equations. And this is now what I meant with the statement at the beginning of part four. This I said, well, the nice thing is that the jets can be used to test the Euler-Lagrange equation weekly, and this is exactly what is meant with that. And why do they test it weekly? Well, if you just look at the definition, so this being zero means that this term right here is zero, okay? And that's supposed to be for all u in, in this subspace of the differentiable jets. Well, so if it's true for all u, it's true for all a, so this means that this needs to be zero. Well, that's good because that was one of the things we had from the Lagrange equation. And this part being zero for all differentiable jets, basically, um, I mean, it's the same condition as this one if one requires this differentiability assumption. Yeah? Ah. So, yeah, that's a good point. I, that's, so, nabla, so the nabla without, okay, um, so nabla u of L, well, that is just given by A of x, L of x, plus just du, without plus or minus, just a normal derivative of L of x. And this is well defined because of this condition, yeah? So or you could also say, if you like, you can also say nabla u is the same thing as um, nabla u plus, um, is it plus or minus? No, I always get confused. Minus, nabla u minus. So this is like, if you add those semi-derivatives, if you subtract those semi-derivatives, they just give you the normal derivative. Yeah, and so those are the weak euler lagrange equations. Okay, and maybe the last thing we... Sorry? Oh yeah, that's correct. There's a, there's a vector one half here, yes. Okay, and maybe let me just write down one more. So there's one more equation which I wanted to write down. Um, but we can also do this after the break. So are there any questions? So maybe I'll clean the board. You think of whether you have questions. Um, and then I'll write down the last equation if we still have time. The last equations are really the linearized field equations. So as I said, I mean, I know it's quite so quite a lot of new things, and that's why I really try to go slowly, and we can discuss them again later tonight, and you'll see, like, you learn more about them in the second lecture later.
Okay, are there any questions about it or so far? Yeah? This is not possible because the, so what we've done to derive the Euler-Lagrange equations, um, if you remember, so we've, took, we've taken a look at the linear term, right? So I wrote down this tau and then something in bracket and then this in bracket needed to be bigger, larger than zero. So maybe a way to explain this is as follows. So if you think about, so this would be like your space of rho as we had it last time, sort of informally. And this would be like your action of rho. And let's just now say this has some form. And so what we've done to derive the Euler-Lagrange equation is basically taking a look, like in some sense, of the derivative of this S tau. And so this just means, well, we, the only thing we really know is that we have a local extremum. So it could be any of those. We don't know that we're sitting really in the minimum. So maybe just in words, so like Euler-Lagrange equations, they correspond to first derivative of S of rho tau vanishes. And then first of all, there's also like a condition, so you can derive another equation which corresponds to the second derivative being larger or equal than zero. So then you know it can't be this one, it can't be this one. But more than that, you can't say. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah, that's correct. So it's really like little, like a lot less information than the causal action actually contains. Okay, so maybe let's just write down the last seven minutes or so the linearized field equations. And this is really like, the linearized field equations are why one does all of this. They will be like, they are equations for fields, um, for those notion of fields we have field equations for those notion of field we have, okay. So what we do is we combine results of section three and four. And how do we do this? Well, as follows. So maybe let's call, just call, yeah, I got caught in weekly. So we do this as follows, just basically express the weak Euler-Lagrange equations, which I've written down over here, um, for family rho tau of section three. Okay, that's basically what we want to do. And I will not write down how you do this and how like you have to do a couple of algebraic reformulations. I'll just tell you those things which you need to basically um, understand the weak euler lagrange equation, the linearized field equations. Let me see, do we actually need this? Okay, let me just write it like this. This gives, or basically, um, the first variation with respect to tau, so you express those, you weak all Lagrange equations for the family, and then you take the first variations of this with respect to tau gives 
the linearized field equations, and I will now write them down. And I need a bigger chalk because otherwise it's very hard for me to notice. And this is the last thing I want to do today. And those are the linearized field equations So how do we write them? They um, just, usually we write them like this. So basically, u, v, uh, sorry, u, um, nabla, v. I'm, I'm going to define this term in a minute. <coughs> At m is equal to 0 for all u in this test space, which we just had. So that's a subset of this of those differentiable chat um, with um, the following definition. So this u nabla v is just given by. So I take the derivative in direction of u of the following quantity. So over the integration. So I'm just going to write m here, but I could just as well write f. And then I have a derivative in direction of v acting on the first variable plus a derivative in direction of v acting on the second variable of L of x, y, integration with, with rho over y. And then I still have to have a term which basically takes care of the constants. Okay, so this is how this equation, this term is defined, and the, the linearized field equations basically say, well, this term is zero. And here, V is really basically, let me just say, um, so this is, uh, let me just put a box around it, and after that, I will say a few more explanatory words about it. So. This is an equation for V. For this chat V, okay? So, and in fact, if you come from here, like, so maybe I should put this in brackets. In fact, this V is, if you take this derivation, which I've just um, indicated here, V is really given by the first derivative the derivative of f at zero. Those are the two functions which were involved in defining this family and the derivative of the family of diffeomorphisms at zero. Um, so this is an equation for v. It is an equation on space-time. That's important. Um, <coughs> And I'll just say in words, so the reason that we do not have here the semi-derivatives here, in particular in the integrand, well, the reason for that are further assumptions, like two more assumptions, which I will not write down. They basically say this thing exists without semi-derivatives. Um, and if you look in the paper, this is contained in the definition of what it means to be a solution. And it's basically like later we will not use those assumptions anyways. I just wanted to write it down like this. <coughs> And finally, last thing before of the break, I just wanted to say uh, chat V, which solves, so let's just call them, we need them later anyway, let's just call them linearized field equations. So chat V, which solves the linearized field equations um, is called a linearized solution for short, yeah? And this gives rise to the space. Um, so space of all linearized, we need this later as well, solutions 
is just called J um, <coughs> Lin. And I will write the Lin here. Sometimes it will pop to the upstairs, but we change the convention on this. Okay. So this is important. And that's all I wanted to say today. Uh, sorry, in this lecture. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not done. Okay. Yeah. Very important, yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. So that's what I, so maybe this was a little bit too fast. So I didn't want to, to take too much time. So what this means is really, so you write down what it means for those um, weak order Lagrange equations to be, um, to be set, like what it means for them to hold for what every member of this family. And this means like you write it down. For every member, so f this is tau, u will be tau dependent, l will be tau dependent, m will be tau dependent, j test will be tau dependent. And then you write this down, and so that means you require for every member of the family that it is an extremum. This is behind this assumption that every member of the family satisfies those weak order Lagrange equations. And then if you've written that down as a condition, then you can derive those linearized field equations. And details you can find in the paper. And I don't remember, I think maybe we have a little exercise about that, but I don't remember. Yeah. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say for now. Um, let's have a coffee and we can still talk about questions or if anything is unclear after the coffee break.